Thank you. I want to start by saying I'm an actually an expert at something. I know you were all hesitating. I wanted to come here and speak about it, but um, I couldn't get the visual aid in here. I am an expert at parallel parking, like really good, and people do not believe me. Uh, but we couldn't get the vehicle in, and the, you got to have a lot of traffic and stuff, so you really see I'm like a one shot. So I couldn't speak on that, so I had to settle on plan B, which is just as awesome. I'm going to talk today about starting things. I start things. I have known that I've started things since I was a young kid. Uh, actually, I'm going to start at about nine years old today, and we're going to do my whole life story. Uh, <laughs> I knew I was good at starting things because I would hear these compliments all the time, like, uh, Shana, did you know you have commitment issues? Or my mom's favorite is jack of all trades, master of none, uh, because I could start lots of things, didn't quite finish all of them, I'd pass them on to the next people quickly. Um, so anyhow, my favorite compliment, though, in all that time came from a 19-year-old girl I was volunteering with in Uganda, and she said to me, you know, thanks a lot for wrecking my life. And that is my greatest compliment today, and that's what I'm going to talk about today, how to wreck your life in just seven easy steps. Now, about six years ago, I was touring a documentary I made, and I did the film festival circuit, and then I went in, uh, to speak on college campuses, high school campuses, and the students would line up afterwards. It's such a huge honor when, you know, they have better things to do. They would line up and tell me their entire life story and everything that they wanted to do that was just like my story that they had seen on the screen. And, and I really took that to heart. And at the end of every single one of those conversations of them telling me what they wanted to do with their life, they would end with, but I just don't know how to get started. So that's what we're going to talk about. All right. We're going to start with three very simple life truths. One, when you want to start something, there is no money, especially when you're young. There's no funding, and that is the best place to be. Do not wait for your Kickstarter to kick in. It doesn't matter. You, when you have no funding, you're in the best spot because everyone will believe in you, especially when you have to work two and three jobs to do it or you have to sell everything you own in the bank and in the bank parking lot. I've done that before. So when you have no funding, people all of a sudden see your passion. When you have funding, it's a job. So if you have no money to start your thing, great, that you're in the perfect spot. Two, there are naysayers. I don't know if you know this. When you want to start something new, people don't believe in your thing. It's your vision. No wonder, right? Now, they say they support you. They'll say, oh, I support you. But the truth is they don't want to feel the pain with you. You know, when you have to, like, wreck everything you know to do it, they don't want to feel the pain, especially the people closest to you. They just want your life to be nice and easy. So they're, they're not totally behind you. And the third thing is... I wanted to start something so bad. I wanted to move to Hollywood at one point, and I had this great life being a teacher in my hometown. Why would you move to L.A.? There's, like, crazy people there, you know? They, like, to all follow in their dreams. Nothing ever works out sometimes. So, anyhow, I ran into this woman, and she changed my life, really. I don't even know who she was. She said, you know, if you're going to start something or follow a dream, there's only two outcomes. And I said, really? And she goes, yeah, there's only two. And I go, well, what are they? She says, well, one, you throw your life into turmoil, you start, you know, you, you get, quit your job, you pick up, you go and start your new thing on no money and no friends, obviously. And you know what? It works out. Everything's awesome. It totally works for you. And you can't remember your life before you started it. And she said, or... <laughs> You turn your life upside down, you sell everything you own, you go out to start the thing, and it fails. It totally bombs. Like, you got to go home with your tail between your legs. It was terrible. It was the stupidest idea. And she said, but you know what? Either way, you don't spend the rest of your life wondering what if. So that was it. I packed up, moved to LA, everything worked out. So I'm just going to talk, I'm going I'm to give you seven just real simple steps of things that you have to have, and you learned them when you were a kid. That's me, my little sister Mary. Fourth grade. I, I'm in fourth grade. My teachers say, okay, we're going to spend a whole week. We're going to start something called mini society. You've got to start a business. Here's your budget, which was fake money, by the way. Here's your monopoly money. Now go 
find your business. Now, John Papagallo, I remember, he brought in his Atari set. And the boys would just play video games, you know, uh, Space Invader or Pong for like a whole week for quarters. That's how much you, you could spend a quarter, play the games. And my friend uh, Melinda, she was doing um, toothpicks that she soaked in cinnamon oil. And they were just like two cents each. And I thought, I don't think they're making enough. I want to like win this. I like to win things. I want to be the best. I want to make the most money. So my dad, he was a fireman, and he, would, he worked for 24 hours off 48 hours. And on his time off, he was a stained glass artist, just beautiful stained glass. And he had a shop, lots of glass in it. So I said, okay, dad, this is what I need on your days off. I need you to cut me all your extra glass in the little squares. So that's, that's what I made my business into. I would cover it with a little copper tape, and I had these paint pens. So if you came to me and said, my mom likes pink and she likes tulips, I'd write your mom's name, make some pink tulips. It was all custom ordered, right, with your name on it. People love that stuff. Well, I made $2,400 in one week, fake money. <laughs> and at the end of the week, we had a chapel ceremony, and I won Young Entrepreneur of the Year. How old are you? Yes, thank you. <laughs> so, you know, I, in the 80s, you could buy a car for that. That was a lot of money. <laughs> Anyhow, I, that's when I really knew. I knew I could set a goal, and I could accomplish a goal. That was fourth grade. All of you guys have something story like that. But the most important thing, the next step is, I looked around my world to see how I spelled that resourceful. When you learn to be resourceful, basically I looked around and I had someone that could work for me, I could convince to do it, and I had some supplies. And those things carried me a long way. They car those were just the starting points to learning how to start something, okay? So from there, you know, I started my first business. I showed horses. Horses were my big thing. And I had to feed the horses and there was a lot of expenses involved. So I started feeding the neighbor's horses. And then the chickens, and then mucking the stalls, and who knows what other thing I did. But I eventually started catering their parties. And from the time I was 10 until I was 18, I made myself invaluable. Quite frankly, the entire community needed me every time they went out of town. Because anybody who had animals needed an expert or someone who knew how to handle animals to deal with it. And so that's what I did. I hit 18, though, and you know your parents, I don't know, they're kind of crazy. They're like, you have to go to college. I was like, college? I had this great life. I didn't want to go. And quite frankly, I was the, uh, the first in my family, you know, the first generation to go to university. So, um, and I'm the oldest child, so they're shipping me off. I didn't know why. And <laughs> you know what was the most painful thing is really just severing all ties to that community, those people I, I had made myself invaluable to. And it ended up being the greatest thing. You get shoved out of the nest, you have to start over, don't you? Those are the greatest moments in your life, actually, when I look back. So they shipped me off to Texas. I went to um, college, and, you know, starting over, I had to come up with some stuff to do and how to make friends. And so I became an RA, and I started selling uh, ramen noodles and blow pops out from underneath my bunk bed at night when people were hungry. And then that developed into used books. You know how lazy college kids are? They don't even return their books at the end of the semester. So I'd be lugging them to the bookstore every week, making my money. And, and uh, that grew into, you know, in the sorority houses, they'd leave behind all the refrigerators and the TVs. Ha! Best job ever. Some people call it looting. But I, I just turned it into a really sweet gig. Called my dad. So anyhow... From there, you graduate college, you know what you have to do? Start over. And if you didn't learn that life skill before you got there, it's really hard after college. So I, um, you know, I had a lot of things to do. I had to, I had to start a lot of businesses and organizations, and I just made all of my 20s. I don't even remember them. There were so many weird things I did in the middle. But the one thing I knew I wanted to do for sure was tell my own stories. I was a good storyteller. And I wanted to, I started making movies. I had moved to LA and uh, brought my screenplays there and uh, acted a little bit, started producing, started a production company. And through that, made my first documentary uh, about a rock band, some friends of mine who put on the largest independent rock concert in history. And I thought, okay, if I can do that, I think I can make my own. 
so that took me to Africa. In 2005, there were no stories coming out of Africa. I had only seen a movie called The Constant Gardener, won the Oscar that year, and I thought, okay, that's it, I'm going. So it took me to Africa, I'm filming my documentary, and I meet a group of 65 street kids. I'm in a house, uh, I go to their house, they're all crammed in there, they're malnourished, they have a fever, they're hungry, um, and I started to think, what the heck, what am I doing? So the phone rings. And it's my friend, Pastor Bob. Now, he's a pastor down in San Diego, California. And he, he calls on the old Nokia, you know, and I can barely hear him. It's broken. And I, I started to tell him what I'm seeing. I said, okay, I'm filming the documentary. He helped me fund it. He bought the camera. I tell him the whole thing. And he says, uh, or no, I, I'm saying, I don't know what to do. Like, should I keep filming the documentary or should I, like, help these people? Like, I don't know which, I don't know. I'm trying to decide. Um, and he said, well, do you know James 127? And I was like, what? I said, is it like a Bible verse? And he said, yeah, do you know it? No, I don't. Just say it to me. That's your job. So he says, well, it says that the religion that God says is pure and right is to look after the orphans and widows in their distress. And I was like, at first, I thought, don't tell me that right now. And then I started to think, wow, that's a pretty good religion. I need to focus. I mean, if that's what's pure and right, I, I, here are all the, I got a lot of work to do. And then I started, I mean, it was a pivotal moment for me. I started to think, maybe I wasn't good at starting things just for me and my friends, but there was something bigger out there. Maybe I was supposed to be here for something other than just my went in Sundance with my documentary. And that's the importance of mentors, quite frankly. That's Pastor Bob there on the right. He ets at the premiere of that documentary when I finally finished it. You know, having someone in your life that challenges you to the next level or reminds you why you're doing the thing you're doing is imperative. I have a lot of mentors in my life, so get yourself a mentor. That's on the list. So uh, let's see, where are we at? We've set a goal. We have been resourceful. We've made ourselves invaluable to a community. We've learned to be resilient. We started over again. College, new jobs, whatever the next thing is. And get yourself a mentor to keep you on track. All right? So from there, I just stayed. That was it. I gave my production company away for a dollar to my friends. And I stayed for seven years. But the first thing I did was I called home. And I told my friend Lori, we were teachers together a long time, and I said, Lori, I have no money, like no funding. I know this is what I always say I can do, but I can't do it. You need to send me anything you have. And she (laughs) collected $10 from each of our friends and sent me $140. And that's what happened. I stayed for seven years. I started with $140. And really, this was the next lesson that I learned in my life, is... I stayed, and I started an organization called Come Let's Dance. It's what the kids used to say to me. Jangu Tuzine in their language. Come, let's dance, because when we didn't have food, what else is there? Come on, we're not going to waste the day. I mean, I learned a lot. They personally invited me into this whole entire new life I didn't even know was an option. And then I personally invited my friend Lori and literally every other person I had ever met. Be careful because we're having a coffee soon, and I'll corner you too. Every person I ever met to sponsor a kid and help me do this. And so that's my next lesson, is that personal invite. I call it the Starbucks strategy. You know, you walk into Starbucks, and you're like, oh, they're going to write my name on the cup and know exactly what I want. And they personally invite you to come back again, because they suck you in. So that personal invite is what built my organization. Um, I love that. So from there... Oh, my goodness. We were, I was learning everything. How to build a sustainable development, I mean, sustainable community. That's not easy. We would start a business for every project we had. So if I had to feed a crew of kids at this house, we had to start, we had to buy a taxi cab to fund that, to fund that house. And I just started learning all about corruption, all about how Africa works, and really how to do stuff without foreign aid. Can I one day walk away? Can I build something that will sustain itself? And that became my goal. But let me tell you the final, final step before we go is you have to know how to fail. I had a horse trainer once tell me you have to fall off 100 times and get back up on the horse again 
before you're moving to the next level. And I was like, what? That's like insanity. It's totally true. I had to learn how to fail a lot. And my, new, my life motto since then is, every failure is a success if you learn from it. So let me quick tell you, I'm in a new, my new gig right now is Vanilla. I, I started an, an international export company. I have about 20 people who work for me, but the truth is I'm looking for hundreds. I want to employ a lot of moms. They can put their own kids through school, sustain their own lives. Well, recently, someone I poured 10 years of my life into destroyed it, stole everything from me, my whole life savings even, and I just wanted to quit. And that's the big lesson there. People will hurt you. I'm not here to lie to you. Things will go wrong. Humans are human. But the truth is I had all those I knew all those lessons from when I was young. I just started over, and in less than about six months, everything was back again. But I really took some soul searching. So fail, and fail a lot, and invite it. And when you do, say, all right, what did I just learn from that? Because i got to keep going. Now, I'm going to end with this. Why would you go and help other people or start things that are going to wreck your life? It's going to wreck your comfort. Why would you do that? One... You have critical thinking skills and problem-solving skills, and that is the uh, most invaluable commodity to the world. Do not let that go. You're wasting it. Two, you have integrity, I hope, and if you don't, go find some. But be willing to say no to profit for your integrity because the rest of the world doesn't have any. Did you know business ethics is the greatest oxymoron? And I'll end on this one bit of advice. When you build something, don't hold on to it too tightly. It might not be for you. And the coolest joy is when you just let it fly because it was for someone else. That is my greatest joy. So I end with this. Go wreck down the walls of comfort. Follow your heart, whatever it is in there, because it might be helping a lot of people. All right? And live an extraordinary life. Thank you.